The same principle applies here, and I'm not going to go over it all. I'm just going to show you a few small little uh, um, t uh, tools that we use in tying branches down. Now, Wayne, I don't know where you ended up. There you are, hiding. It looks like you tied some of these, and it looks like you used regular baling twine, and that's one of the things I brought, which is one of the most common things that people use. They put baling twine. So in a baling twine situation, we simply would do one of two things, tie down to this low wire that the irrigation's on. If you don't have a low wire, we end up putting a nail or a sheetrock screw down in the bottom of the tree. And we would just, I didn't bring a hammer or a nail, but it just goes right in on one side of the tree, leaving it out about a half inch to tie something to. <clears throat> so failing that, we can sometimes tie to the conduit pole, which is also good, which I'm going to do today. Or Assuming the nail was there, I'm just going to use the trunk for that sort of an example. I'd tie to the nail, and then I would just come up to find any particular branch I need to tie down. <clears throat> None of them are really bad. But the knot that you tie is what's critical. Now, everybody here, I hope, knows this particular knot. I don't even know the name of it. But it's a knot that won't slip. What's it called? I don't think it's right. It's a tree tie knot. <clears throat> so gather up because this is a you are the ones that already know it don't gather up. The ones that don't know it gather up. Who's who had the pocket knife? I think Bob Anderson left. Just cut about right where my finger is. <clears throat> so the first thing is just to put the string through the loop. And at this point in the knot, the part coming up from the tree is straight. You simply hold this tight here so it doesn't move, and then you turn the knot over. You pull on the small end until the knot turns over. Now what you see is that the part coming up from the tree goes around, and the part that is in my hand, the short part, is the straight. So this is the way the knot started. This part is straight. I pull the knot through until it turns over. Hold it, just put the second half of the half hitch on. That will not slide up, and you can just adjust it. The second tech, uh, material we use is called Ava Strap. It comes in huge rolls. I didn't want to bring a whole roll, so I just brought some piece. But the roll's about that big around. It's a waxed, multi-strand strapping material. Comes in half inch width, and each one of the strands is held together by wax. So you can peel off individual strands if you want, but I don't know how many strands. But we use this to tie several branches at the same time. And the typical way we do this is with a sheetrock screw as well. I don't have one, so I'll just tie to the conduit post in this particular case. But we go around the nail, we tie the whole half inch strand, just a double half hitch knot so that it, this will tighten up. Then we come up to whatever height we, let's suppose we're tying up in here. We really want long ones, so we'll cut it about right there. <clears throat> then you just stand back and you split it up. So you, this is old and <sighs> I had two several pieces tied together. So this is really strong stuff. You can use this to tie down loads on your truck. But generally, I split it into four strands. However many branches, I can sometimes split it into five. And then I can tie down four branches with one tie. Again, I go around the branch. This doesn't need it. But I do want to show one of the things that I like to do, and that's to tie pendant. So I like to tie it down so that the tip is halfway between horizontal and straight down at a 45 degree down. You generally want to find a place where there's a little spur to hold it from sliding in. and. Uh, Hopefully it won't slide down, but then you just simply adjust to where you think the angle's about right. If this is too far out, you can come in. So I like that angle there. Then I hold it. I do my knot, turn it over. And that won't tighten up. It won't move. I've got four strands to work with. Works really well on newly planted trees if you want to do it. None of these branches need tying. 
because they're already relatively flat, but I still, when I do tie a branch, I like to get it down below horizontal. In this case, I'm using that little spur to hold it. So, with the cameraman, in slow motion again. That part's still straight. Turn the knot over, hold it with my finger, put the second half on. It's just like roping cows, and you, the quicker you can do that. Anybody a roper around here? Well. <clears throat> If you don't need four, and you got four, just leave that out there. These are wonderful problems with the mower. The mower grabs that and rips the whole tree off. Because <laughs> this stuff is dang strong. So when I don't do it, I just do this. I just hang it up in the tree for some future as I cut it off. Well, that's another t technique. Baling twine's the cheapest, but I love this stuff because it uh, goes a long ways, and I can do four with one tie down at the base. Position. Two months of growth. If we tie now, when the, you all remember the physiology or we've learned it, a branch will grow both on the tip, but it lays down new wood with a cambium all along it, so it grows in girth. Once we have it in that position for about two months during the growing season, the new wood that's laid down generally will hold it in that position. If it lasts three or four months, it's even better. But that'll lead me right into this next little technique, and that's one of the... What do I do with new trees? Now, the ones that come from the nursery have really small, little, flexible branches. And to go through with Ava strap sometimes seems too expensive. And so a number of our growers have gone to these flexible, non-coated, small diameter wires to bend branches down. And you had a newer looking one than I do. These are some rusty ones I grabbed from our pickup. But we generally will use these on newly planted trees and so small feathers. We hook it around the branch at a certain point and then back down around the trunk at a certain point. We try to find some little thing on the trunk to hook to and then we just put it there without tying it back on itself. If we tie it back on itself, we generally get girdling. So it's not tied here. We don't go sit here and wind it. We just bend it around, hold it, bend it around, hold it, and hopefully that's enough. On newly planted trees, that works well. Just make it, that's a perfect word. Just make a shepherd's hook, but just crimp it down with your finger so that it won't pop out. These are cheap. There's a guy up in New York, an orchard supply guy that sells you bundles of them. People make a little holster thing and you just carry them whatever length you want. You pull one out, put it on there, bend these feathers down, and it works extremely fast. The other idea is to use these relatively long rubber bands. They sell them in bundles. They're relatively cheap. Uh, this one hasn't been opened yet. I don't have a pocket knife when I need one. Fortunately, I won't let you on the plane with these things anymore. Well, that is a serious pocket knife there, Marvin. So the way we do these, we just wear them on our sleeve, and these can be uh, utilized by just using the trunk itself. Now, small, this is the kind of, uh, these are all pretty, pretty tough, but this will probably work. We go down around the trunk itself on the rubber band. You kind of get used to how far down you got to go. Now, I judge it by saying this is the branch. I want it in that angle. I want it down. And I generally like the rubber band to be almost horizontal. So if it's from here to here, I'm going to tie this maybe down here, back on itself. We just simply stretch it out and then hold it down. These are not perfect. When it's hot, they like stretch and they move. But for newly planted trees, we've done timing studies sending kids out, high school kids with these, just wear a sleeve of these and dart down the row, putting five to six, because if I get 10 feathers, the five or six biggest that I want to bend down, I can do an acre with 30 man hours, or boy hours, because they're not really man hours yet, or girl hours, but they still work pretty decent. So it's generally something that's not cost prohibitive, the rubber bands are cheap, and it's one of the things I kind of like. So these are the two techniques that are being used in New York, this uh, rubber band or the soft wire on newly planted trees. If 
we then have to come into older trees, we're generally using Ava strap or baling twine. I said down there, I hope I don't have to come in on older trees and do any tying. I want to just tie the first year and be done with it. If I get crop in the second year, it works perfectly because that crop starts bending branches down. If I lose the crop in the second year, and I were losing it in the third year, then I got to do more tying. And so then you end up doing a little more labor. I want to emphasize the point that this is a cost, but it's not the overriding cost in orcharding business. <clears throat> if you have to spend uh, 30 hours times, what do you pay a kids? You know, eight bucks, 750 or whatever minimum wages. You're going to spend a couple hundred dollars to the acre to do this branch tying down. How many bushels to the acre does it take to get that $240, $250 back? You know, $10 a bushel, you know, we're going to be talking about 25 extra bushels, that's one bin. So on these thousand trees, if I can, by bending branches down, keep the tree calm and get just a few more apples, this is not really an expense. This makes money. And it's so simple. I hope you don't view it as a really um, burdensome thing. What would you do to that tree? Is it down enough now and so on and so forth? It is. I wouldn't do anything else to it except I'd do a little touch-up pruning, just touch-up. This is just starting the second year, so the only time I want to cut out a branch at this age is if it really, really is obnoxious or just got to be way too big. But I do want to simplify this branch. So I've got to choose between these two and I've got to choose between this and that. Uh, let's suppose I'm going to take this one off. This comes more into the tractor alley. I'm going to take off that one because it's so upright. But that's all I would do. I'm going to come up here and do the same thing. Let's fix one of those. In this case, let's keep the guy coming this way. So we'll take off that side. Um, those are all really close together. Is this one of yours, Steve? No, no. I wondered how we got that ball of branches right there. But nevertheless, I'm going to leave them for now. But I'm going to have to start reducing that number in the fourth year. We're just the end of the second year, so we're going to keep it all this year, hopefully grow apples on that, and then next year we'll start to fix it. You wouldn't take this one out? Yeah, I got to, I got to, no, I, no, I wouldn't take it out. I, I, either that came from the nursery, I haven't probably grown any apples on it. It's not that bad of an angle, it's going to come out eventually. but it's going to come out eventually, maybe next year or the year after. Has there been anything where you've had too many limbs to where you think you're choking your leader from getting <clears throat> If I leave those limbs in an up position, yes. If I bend them down, like I wish this one would have been bent down a little more than this one, I could tie those down with some Ava strap real quick. Then I don't feel that that chokes the leader out. But this is kind of a problem right here where it could really affect the leader development. There's so many of them. We're about a foot and a half away from that wire. Yeah, probably could get by. But I did want to come back to this branch right here. This, I think, gets at what Mike Parker was mentioning. The diameter of that side branch is probably more than the leader itself. Those are ones you really got to try to avoid. And the rule is, if it's bigger than half the diameter of the leader right above it, you should consider eliminating it. So let's take that one out just because of its diameter. We'll leave a stub. We could maybe make the same argument down in here. Well, we'll help this out just a little bit. But the second year pruning has to be considered just a little bit of corrective where it's needed, but try to keep almost everything else. Can you not pull these down too far? I don't think so. Well, obviously you can take things down just to where they're just straight down. But this is one of the beauties of 12 feet again. When you do a little more tying in the early years, you never get wide. And so, in fact, your herbicide strip might be a little too wide. You know, you can have just a couple of feet of herbicide strip on each side, because that's all the tree's going to, width it's going to be. No, but this is just the point. It relates to making decisions that you have to live with for 20 years based upon some trees that are not going to be here 20 years from now. Or making your decision based upon a particular tractor that I have that's too wide, therefore I got to go wide, and therefore I'm going to plant wider than optimum make your decision on what's going to make you the most money and that's to be plant a lot of trees per acre then adjust the rest of it cut down those miserable trees and plant your 12 foot rows because that now costs you a lot of money you missed a, an extra row of trees here that you could have planted because of those trees the same applies to tractors i know everybody's got certain older tractors 
I tell people, go ahead and plant your 12-foot rows. You can live with it with your old tractors for at least four years. And by four years from now, you'll be making so much money you can afford a new tractor. So you just start planting. I got to get a different tractor. Once the trees are in the ground, it forces you. Once the trees are not in the ground, you just keep going the same old way. Maybe we, we've run out of time, Marvin, uh, but just let me get off my soapbox just one more second. And that is that as you think about planting new orchards, you've got to think about what's going to be happening next year, five years, 10 years, 15, and 20. And I'm trying to convince you that many people in the industry are probably going to be using some more different machinery for pruning platforms, for hand thinning platforms, for harvest, harvest assist platforms. We were talking about one last night I'm pretty enthused about. But when you've got old style trees, big wide roads, you can't use those machines, those new advances that are going to come along in the next 20 years. These narrow plantings, tall spindle, I think is adaptable to almost everything coming down the pike. So I've had growers that I've been preaching to for years and that have got on the bandwagon 10 years ago, 15 years ago. They're now set up so that if they had, uh, our, our average farm size is about 250 acres. Let's just say 300 to make it easy. If they have a 300 acre farm and they started planting this system 15 years ago, about, like Mike said, 4 to 5%, they now got more than 100 acres of this. And so when I tell them a platform is going to save you money, it's a no-brainer. They got acres they can use it on. The other guys that have just been on the fence, well, I don't know about that Robinson, you know, they now want to start, and this platform craze is catching on, but they've got no acres they can use it on. This is what I said to my growers, don't ever put another tree in the ground that's not three feet by 12. Well, you know, you can adjust that, but the orchard you plant this spring, you're going to live with for 20 years, and hopefully it's one that you can manage and work with all the future technology. Now that might be, you know, heresy to some people. Uh, but, you know, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I hope that you really think long and hard about, uh, you know, the things I've tried to teach, the, the message, and uh, you're the one that's going to make the money, I believe. What about a tip bearer like Rome? Isn't there a more profitable tip bearer than Rome? Let's see, let's pick a different one. Okay, let's pick Granny Smith. Okay. For us, Cortland happens to be one that's had a resurgence with MCP, but even Rome. Rome's, with the tip bearing varieties, tend to not do so well at the extremely close spacings. And so I generally will plant them at three and a half feet by 12 instead of three feet by 12. But I still want to pack in there fairly close, and I still want to do this bending down, and it works just beautifully. They, they take much less tying down. So in that case, if I tie down feathers on the year of planting, that's it. They just flop and flop and flop after that. And they work well with renewal pruning. I can come back in here and get a new shoot on at Rome, keep the tree in close to the trunk. The problem with our traditional style of pruning, we keep letting them expand out and expand out and expand out because limbs are permanent, but it's not the case with this. This has been a production of BRCC-TV, the education channel, in conjunction with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension, empowering people, providing solutions.